You're listening to Neo Cash Radio. We discuss the future of money today. In the studio with you, it's JJ, Darren, and Randy. Big week for crypto gains. A library to the rescue. Coinbase no longer covers the transaction fees. All this and more on episode 198 here on Wednesday, March 15th, 2017. Darren? Uh, this week, we have uh, the traditional markets. We have gold up to $1,219. Silver's up to $17.32. Oil is down to $48.96. The Dow is down to 20,950 points. And the U.S. Treasury yield is down slightly to 3.112%. Wow. And in the crypto markets, we've got Bitcoin up to $1,250. Ethereum doubles to $33.14. Dash more than doubles to $99. It was cruising just a little above $100 uh, for the first time today. It's really been rising fast. Zcash is up to $45.74. And Monero is also up to $19.39. Excellent. Thank you, Randy and Darren. Just a reminder, you can tune in to Neocash Radio every Wednesday. I don't want to miss out on a single moment of awesome Neocash content, including special episodes and bonus interviews. Subscribe to our podcast on Google Play Music, iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, uh, and many more. Well, starting out here, I screwed up my screen, guys. Uh, starting out, the Winklevoss ETF that has been talked about forever. If denied. I denied. Denied. So, I mean, it's Again. They, they can't catch a break. Yeah, but uh, so is this it? Are we not going to hear about it ever I, you again? Know, I don't think so. I think they've pretty much... I mean, this has to be it. If, if as long as they hold, held on to their bitcoins, they're pretty happy right now, right? I mean, and they've got that Gemini exchange going, so there you go. Well, so there's a couple things. So the the Winklevoss, 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 Voss twins. Uh, <laughs> if if you've seen the movie The Social Network, these are the guys that allege they came up with the idea for Facebook, and that uh, Mark Zuckerberg took it from them, or that they uh, didn't get any compensation, or something like that. Uh, anyway, they've been trying to open this Bitcoin ETF. Uh, for several years now, and the SEC has denied them several times. Their problem with it is that it is uh, that cryptocurrencies aren't able to be regulated, um, so, right, they, so they don't like it. But they've said no again, and it doesn't sound like they're going that the the twins are going to give up. And there's a couple other companies that have filed uh, for a Bitcoin ETF as well. And I, I, can you explain an ETF? Dan? Yeah, an ETF is an exchange traded fund. So what it is is something you can buy or sell, like a stock. On a on an exchange, so either the New York Times Exchange or American Exchange or Nasdaq, and um, it it's supposed to be a, basically a stock that you buy or play the role of a stock, and it tracks the price of the underlying asset. So you can buy an ETF in the Dow Jones, an ETF in the SP five hundred. You can add one in oil, for example. There, there's gold uh, ETFs. Uh, so, so stocks or commodities as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But like, but it's just tied to an underlying asset. So, um, uh, uh, the, so you're saying that it, this one would be that 1250, it would track the price of Bitcoin, which is what you're saying. Right. Right. So, I mean, and the, there could be one share that's worth $12 and 50 cents and that, that tracks the price of one hundredth of a Bitcoin or something. Like okay. That. Okay. So, so yeah. So what is the, per- I, What's the purpose of having an ETF? For, well, if, you know, if, if, if you ET- want to buy Bitcoin, you just... Yeah, you can... if you wanted to buy Bitcoin, that's fine. But if you have money in an IRA, okay, you're not going to be able to do that. But if there was an ETF, mm-hmm. then you could uh, take... Uh, you, if there was an ETF trading on exchange, you could probably take your money from whatever stock you're invested in and move it over to Bitcoin. So this was something that potentially could have brought a lot of new investors into this. Oh, yeah. Uh, and I, it was funny. I saw the morning of the SEC uh, announcement, which was Friday, last Friday. There was some other announcement that <clears throat> a completely different department from the SEC was delivering. And I guess they'd set up an email address where you could send in questions or comments for this other program, whatever they were announcing. And it had nothing to do with Bitcoin. And like before the their release press release actually started, the guy came out and said um, something to the effect of, I don't. We don't have anything to say about Bitcoin. I don't even know what that is. I was just told to like tell you that. Please stop emailing us about Bitcoin. Um, but anyway, it, it was it's pretty interesting, and there were a lot of people, of course, saying, "Oh, the the and the price did fluctuate greatly that day. It went yes. from around a thousand up to thirteen hundred, and then back down to about. I, I'm sorry, it had been around uh, like eleven hundred, I think, in the morning. Then it rose up to a little over thirteen hundred, and then went back down to around a thousand, if I remember right, on Friday. So it definitely jumped around with the news, but it's pretty, you know, it's pretty much rebounded 
uh, since. Yeah, and it's, it's impressive with all the different things going on, and we'll right. get to some of those things now, but just to, to capture the ETF denied, China talking about regulating exchanges, and then the the uh, block size debate raging and in, in, in even na- escalating. I, the debate is turning nasty. Yes. And so not long after a bug was posted on the Bitcoin Unlimited GitHub, which, Darren, you're telling me that the information is slightly different. Yep. The Bitcoin Unlimited node suffered an attack, and the exploit caused about 500 nodes to go offline. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the patch was already out at that point. Yeah, that, that's information I have, that the patch was posted, and so that basically advertises that there's a problem, and it was exploited. And but and then so Bitcoin Unlimited had to rush everybody upgrading, right? Um, so so this you know obviously caused some press, and then I I saw press reports of how oh BU is just not ready for prime time and like all this negative uh, spin. And I'm not saying that I, I'm for or against those stories, but it's it's the rush to judgment is just so sharp these days. Yeah, it's 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 very sharp, and uh, now there's more Bitcoin Unlimited mo- nodes than we're running before. This attack, uh, and it it did knock like we were reporting five hundred nodes offline, but uh, they're 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 right back on there. And uh, well, and there are Bitcoin core supporters on Reddit, whether it, just making threats of you know attacking any wanting yeah. to, to run DDoS attacks on any the, should any should be Bitcoin Unlimited yeah. fork or anything like that. I, they I, would just I, immediately begin running. I, I saw attacks. that there's somebody that says they're going to try to exploit a bunch of zero day exploit on uh, Bitcoin Unlimited. And, and a zero-day exploit is an ex- is something that you can do to abuse a program or use a program in an unintended consequ- with an unintended uh, outcome uh, without alerting the, the, uh, the, the people, the programmers that made that program. So if right. it's done before the, pro- the people that make the program know about it, it's called a zero-day exploit. Well, so That's what right. happens if Bitcoin Unlimited has a bug and they it's open source software and it's going through GitHub? So if someone posts a bug and they need a fix, I mean, as soon as that bug is posted, what's stopping anyone from from exploiting well, it? Uh, what has happened is if there was a severe bug, uh, somebody might, you know, co- through uh, covert channels or, or uh, somehow not uh, in a public channel, uh, explain that bug to people. That's what uh, basically an ethical hacker would do or... Or a white hat hacker, right? And and that's something also in some of the uh, one of the, the news stories I saw about this that they were talking about ways of not using a public repository for for that sort of stuff. Uh, well, the discourse at this point seems to have escalated well past what one one call a debate, I suppose. Now it's more closely resembling American politics with canned rhetoric and polarizing positions. And BitClub has been accused of performing a malleability attack on the network in an effort to make a case for SegWit. All while Bitcoin Unlimited garners more support, Bitcoin Unlimited has 32.5% of the uh, last thousand blocks, wow. and SegWit is down to 27.4%. Yeah. And and this is really telling, uh, if you ask me, because I, I I believe both are, we know Unlimited has their threshold at 75%, and uh, SegWit, I think they had their threshold at 95%, which uh, there's been discussion of lowering that. Um, but even if both thresholds are at 75%, uh, b- basically, these numbers, Unlimited having 32% and uh, SegWit having 27%, uh, that basically guarantees a stalemate. As long as those two k- people mining for, or the, those b- those actors that are mining for SegWit and Unlimited keep the same proportion, it's gonna, it's, I think the, you can draw a conclusion that it's a stalemate, or if it's not a stalemate, it will be for a long time. Yeah, I mean, that's something worth noting is that is it even possible to gather 75% of the support among all the different people running? Now, not only nodes, of course, but know. mining, of course. Also, mm-hmm. also very telling is the uh, people that haven't decided they want to flag either one. So, right. so there, there seems to be either some apathy or some not keeping up with uh, the, the the network. And that's, that's actually rather surprising from my perspective because m- many... Well, mm-hmm. Almost all Bitcoin mining is done with pools, and how can a pool not make a decision on this, right? I can understand how a miner just has something running in their basement, could not make a decision, but it's really the pool owner that needs to make that decision, right? and then the miner has to choose to, to support him or not. But uh, 
Uh, so, so it is surprising that uh, so few people have switched over. What is a malleability attack anyway? So a malle- malleability attack is uh, something in Bitcoin. So uh, basically, uh, the way the signature works, I, there's two random numbers that are picked. And the way the math works is you can, if you just know the signature, you can make a new signature that's valid, that's different. And uh, transactions are basically kept track of by the hash of the transactions. It's like a, a it's supposed to be a unique identifier, but um, or not supposed to, but it, it would be nice if it was a unique identifier. And uh, so if somebody can change the signature a little bit and it's still a valid transaction, it would still go from and go to the same person or same accounts, same addresses. But um, if somebody can change the transaction, that will change the hash and if you were programming something that used that hash to uh, to uh, kind of catalog your transactions, uh, if there's a malleability attack happening, that programming is going to have problems. Uh, but but uh, the best thing you can do is just not use the hash as a unique identifier because it's not. So, uh, so right. that's that's what you have there. Right. Okay. Well, I mean, this is all having consequences, and there are other uh, other areas that are being affected, the unseen, if you will. Randy, you've got a story here. Yeah, well, uh, Coinbase uh, has announced that they will no longer be paying the transaction fees for Bitcoin or Ethereum transactions. Uh, of course, Coinbase is a very popular cryptocurrency wallet. Uh, they posted several updates on their blog today. That was the biggest news, though. Um, quote, since our inception, we have been paying network fees on behalf of our customers to help support the growth of the Bitcoin and Ethereum networks. Um, we now have over 6 million users worldwide, and this has become a significant cost. So essentially... Um, these are the fees that go to miners, right? Yes. Right. Yeah, yeah, and so they've been covering it uh, yeah. for, for some time now. I guess they've been open, I think, five years. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they're now going... This is for on-chain transactions as well. So they also said that transactions between Coinbase accounts will continue to be off-chain and free. Uh, it was interesting to me, the discussion on the Ethereum subreddit today uh, has part of the headline is saying, people will soon find out how expensive it is to use Bitcoin instead of F or instead of Ether now that the uh, transaction fees aren't being, you know, they're being passed along to the to the user. So right. uh, they will, Coinbase is also going to be discontinuing account access via SMS or text message. Uh, they cited the rapid growth of global, the rapid growth of global smartphone use since they first launched their SMS account access feature in 2013. So uh, those are a couple of the changes that are coming up. Uh, we actually talked well, I actually looked a little bit more into uh, what else has been going on with Coinbase, and they we didn't did we didn't talk about Hawaii, did we? What's going on in Hawaii? No, I don't believe. Um, I'm going to jump down a little bit here just to talk about that because Coinbase is where I found it mostly talked about. Uh, Hawaii's division of financial institutions is uh, requiring that all cryptocurrency exchanges operating within Hawaii must register as money transmitters and hold redundant cash reserves for all of their customers' digital currency holdings. So, uh, a couple weeks ago. Coinbase pulled out of Hawaii. Anyone who had an account open in Hawaii uh, has until March 27th, I believe, March 29th, to close their account. Um, basically, if someone's got one Bitcoin, which what was at $1,200 today, Coinbase has to hold $1,200 in cash uh, for that amount. Yeah, so that, doesn't, I mean, that's that's pushing the anyone out. And that, that doesn't make any sense because what if the price of Bitcoin changes? they got to all of a sudden come up with more cash reserves because... They they have Bitcoin. Well, I don't, this doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah, it's something they said in their blog. Is this, this policy is obviously untenable? Uh, no digital currency business, and frankly, no commercially viable business anywhere has the capital to supplement every customer Bitcoin with redundant dollar collateral. So yeah, besides the fact that it's extremely volatile, um, they make the point that compliance with this policy would would actually you know deter. It wouldn't protect consumer funds. It would siphon millions of dollars away from a bunch of their other operations, so they wouldn't be able to retain staff or you know, reinvest in their own business to keep up with the latest technology and the latest security. Uh, instead, they'd just be holding a bunch of cash and doing nothing with it. So, yeah. Wow, uh, what a waste. Yeah, the good news is potentially that they the, the Hawaii State House of Representatives is uh, has a bill that is – creating a blockchain technology and digital currency working group. So they're going to be studying uh, cryptocurrency and blockchain startups, and hopefully they'll be allowing these things back in Hawaii soon without too much regulation, I can hope. Something like that, not as severe, happened in uh, New Hampshire. Right. And uh, this term in the House, it's been repealed in the House, but it still has to go through the rest of the process. Uh, But uh, let's hope we can also... 
get some freedom in New Hampshire. Basically, uh, I'm not sure everything it affects, but I know that Poleniex was uh, not servicing New Hampshire residents because of the laws that were made in the state house. Thank you so much. Yeah, well, and the state house is, is now re- trying to repeal that law and to make it uh, so that people, so that Bitcoin and bo- blockchain businesses, um, cryptocurrency exchanges and such don't have to. Their users don't have to register as money transmitters, as money transmitters, and it's trying to remove uh, the regulation that would sort of stall out a lot of the uh, a, a lot of the innovation that we'd hope to have from the startups that are here in right. New Hampshire. So yeah, speaking of a startup in New Hampshire, there's a library LBRY which uh, rescues which uh, uh, rescues twenty thousand dollar academic lectures over over four terabytes of data uh, that was deleted by UC Berkeley. Now, uh, today, the University of California, Berkeley, has deleted 20,000 co- college l- lectures from its YouTube channel. Why? Berkeley removed the videos because of a lawsuit brought by two students from another university under the American Disabilities Act. Now, these were videos that were available free. You could get these, and you could watch them, and you could just sit there and watch them, and that's it. That's, you know, you, nothing was required of you other than your time and your internet connection. Uh, so uh, LBRY copied all 20,000 and are making them permanently available for free via LBRY. Wow. Well, that's awesome. And and uh, we've, talked, we've talked with their CEO, Jeremy Kaufman, before. Uh, we had him on the show. And uh, we've JJ and I have actually been doing, full disclosure, we've been doing a little bit of video work with them. Uh, we've been posting the show here when we can up on Library. We've run into a little bit of difficulty uh, in the past, and um, th- they're working on... You know, updating their uh, their platform. In fact, they just uh, I think announced that they were going to be finally opening up the invite list a bit, so anyone with a GitHub account can download the newest client. Um, but uh, yeah, it's been interesting to see what kind of content they're getting posted there, and and we hope to keep putting uh, Neo Cash Radio up there, among the other places we put it up every Wednesday night. This it just sounds absurd. I mean, the the last story was pretty absurd. Hawaii. Uh, basically outlawing Bitcoin, right? I right. mean, effect- exchanges, effectually, at least, yeah. exchanges, and, uh, or any business. I thought it said any business has a, to have... Dealing with digital currencies. Yeah, I think if you're holding it on behalf of somebody else, that's... Okay. But it's it's like the, the government's, like, it, well, we can't do nothing attitude. is like, well, yes, you can do nothing. You'll do a lot less harm by doing nothing than, than doing something stupid. And, and And then this here, it's like, well... Why would you remove free videos because of of uh, they 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 don't have uh, they didn't have captions captions for deaf people yeah, yeah so if yeah. they can't if they can't hear them no one else should have or, access or, to them or the braille I think or, or, I think this is just like a, uh, it almost sounds like because they came from a different university students from another university filed a a, a suit against a different a, 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 maybe a competing university for all I know a different I don't know. university yeah. I wonder if this is some kind of civil suit where they're just trying to get some kind of settlement. or I, I don't know. I, I'm just guessing. It's just crazy. But it And the strange thing is, I mean, we upload videos to YouTube, and they do an automatic captioning. I mean, it's usually a pretty poor job. Sure. But there's some attempt. But even, yeah, I but mean, I, we've, I've, I've captioned videos I, I, before voluntarily, and I, I think, think there are people out there that do that, and you can leave need it. They translate them to Braille or something like that, or... I don't know. Oh, I, I got it. Oh, okay. it's like a blind person can't? A deaf well, person or a blind person. But if you, yeah, if well, you caption the text, there's I there's got to be, con- I don't know. But it's still. Well, anyway, the, the American with Disability Act is, is uh, making us all, or making uh, people with uh, full functioning bodies dumber. I think that's a an unintended consequence of the, whoever wrote this Americans with Disabilities Act, I think they would even agree with that, that taking 20,000 college yeah. lectures judged, down. Whichever judge came to this conclusion. But when yeah. the, I mean, when, but you, just think about this in, from a technology standpoint. I hear, you know, J- Jeremy's here in New Hampshire. You, you talk to him and he's, you know, he tells you about LBRY and you get excited about it. Sounds good. But uh, you're, you're what really, I mean, it's going to be more complicated to use than YouTube or something like that. Why would you want to use LBRY over something else? Well, this is a very good reason, right? Because now these videos are going to be alive forever and you can watch them forever and, and they're academic. I mean, it's, it's not like it's some weird type of content, which uh, people might want to use LBRY for, but it's, 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 you know, very mainstream and uh, uh, wholesome content. I mean, it's, it's, it might not be. You might not want you to put your three-year-old in front of a general relativity lecture, but uh, 
Well, and uh, think about it from a decentralized standpoint. So library does decentralized uh, media sharing and things like that. But how else are you going to get captions for these 20,000 videos? Either UC Berkeley is going to have to pay for that out of taxpayer funds to pay someone to professionally do it, or they can leave them up like Wikipedia style where they can ask for people to contribute uh, captions and translations and things like that. And But taking the videos down certainly isn't going to solve that. But because they're hosted now... You know, there may be a chance of that, but yeah, just to completely delete them is <laughs> yeah, outrageous. I guess somebody could start their own YouTube channel and put all these videos up. That'd be funny. <laughs> Too hot terrible. for YouTube. Yeah. yeah. Well, we uh, we want to we want to talk about a few more things, and one thing uh, we want to get to is hardware wallets. Randy? Yeah, I've I've been playing around with the hardware wallets just out of curiosity. Um, I, I again, out of the three of us here on the show, I'm definitely the newest to cryptocurrency, and I I'm concerned very much with my with security of uh, my funds and things like that. And we've as we've said many times here on the show, if you don't control the private keys, you don't control the funds. And so keeping things on an exchange uh, or even even an app, um, I on my phone, any device that I'm using, you know, like a computer. Certainly with what we talked about last week with WikiLeaks and the CIA. Um, leak you know there's just so many ways that devices can be overtaken by either your government or by any, anyone who's surfing the net for any kind of vulnerabilities uh, hardware wallets present a another layer of protection um, from that so these are usb devices that you plug in um, to your to your computer or to your phone uh, there are some wallets apps that can work with your um, hardware wallets. So I've been playing with a Keep Key and a Ledger Nano S. I haven't tried a Trezor or um, any other brands. But basically what it does is it signs transactions for you. Um, it creates wallets offline so that um, ba- they're deterministic wallets. So basically when you create one account, you can create many different accounts that run off the same seed phrase. Yeah, yeah. And so even if this device is lost, you can restore all of your accounts and all of your funds with another one of these devices or any wallet that uses the same sort of uh, mnemonic seed phrase protocol. Right. It's the BIP39 protocol, right, I think, right. that, that creates this sort of seed phrase. It's 12 words, 25 words. It depends. Um, but anyway, so even if you lose this device, um, you can st- restore your your uh, private keys and your funds and still have access to them. So that was what was most interesting to me. And again, that these wallets are generated offline. So your private key is never transmitted, uh, encrypted or otherwise over um, over the Internet. You've, it's and, all, it's all it's, done on the on and, the device. And I, my understanding is like it's bare metal processing or something, yeah, which means were, that it can't be transmitted yeah, to you, the device or be pulled from the device by yeah, anything. The, the, yeah, the, there's no uh, command you can give the device to give you the private key. It, there is um, all it will do is broadcast the signature. And uh, the one I saw would uh, was a Trezor, and it would hook up to a, a laptop, and so you would just you could interact with it through your laptop, and then you'd have to push a button to se- sign your transaction or something like that. Now, now the KeepKey has a nice big display size, um, and it shows you the QR codes and stuff right on the device, um, which is nice. Then you're not displaying your balance to anybody, like on your screen. Um, your and the, the Ledger Nano S is really small. I mean, it fits on your keychain. It's pretty neat. Um, and then the the Trezor, as, again, I haven't used, but I've seen, and I've got, I've seen a lot of reports that it's a little like flimsy and doesn't hold up as well. Um, I can't confirm that, obviously. But um, Ledger just recently updated their firmware for Nano S, and you can actually hold Bitcoin, Dash, Ethereum, Zcash, Dogecoin, Litecoin, Ethereum Classic, uh, Stratus tokens. I've never heard of those ones before. But it also helps with like a, it can be used like a FIDO UTF device for for helping with uh, two factor authentication. U U two F. You that what did I say? UTF. U two F. Thank you. Um, also included with this now, which is nice. Um, because with the keep key currently, when I log in with my PIN or a passphrase, it opens all of my accounts. And this, it was the same with the Ledger Nano S, uh, but currently now it's it's added basically the ability to have multiple seed phrases, multiple accounts, multiple PINs and things like that. So you've got plausible deniability. So in the case of, a, of an actual brute force attack, someone in person sa- knows what you have in your hand by some strange chance and says, hey... You know, I want access to all of your funds. Put your pin in now. 
well, before when you did that, again, it would show all of your funds and stuff like that. But now this is something where you can have multiple who know only the user, only you know how many accounts you actually have open. So uh, you can actually enter any passphrase along with your PIN and it will open some kind of account because it generates it mathematically. And so it looks, but it'll probably show as it would show a zero balance because the key isn't signed right. So I, I'm not familiar with how all of that works, but it, it adds some level of security. You could have a dummy account with a small amount of coins in it. So you could just say, Hey, I just use this for my everyday. You know, I don't, I don't keep a large amount of funds in here and there's no way that anyone will be able to prove otherwise. Excellent. Well, thanks for that report on the uh, hardware wallets, Randy. Yeah, thanks. Security is extremely important. In fact, it's your fir- it should be your first re- first call of responsibility is making sure your your coins are secure and then of course yourself. But of uh, well, but, vice anyway. versa. But yeah, yes. Uh, so let's talk about Ethereum. Then we've got a bunch of updates we want to get to and some uh, milestones for Ethereum. Yeah, yeah. Well, they they hit a two billion dollar market cap this week uh, with their rise to doubled. Uh, they hit around thirty three. Uh, the Celerity Programming Language version 0.4.10 is released. Wow. Uh, let's so Bitcoin is the only other coin to have a $2 billion market cap, right? Uh, two billion. Yes. Two billion with yes. a B. Well, and yes. and really, we talked about market caps earlier today, JJ, and you yes. said you weren't really a big fan of market caps as metrics. I was just, I, and I joined the conversation. I Would you share yeah, it with our I, listeners? Yeah, you know, it's... it's I don't think it's. Uh, I mean, what what value is that metric? It's a little bit more value than the price, like the price of the the coin. Okay, it, that's it true. It gives you the. It the gives clout you. It's a two coin. dimensional metric. It gives yeah. you a coin price by coin size or yeah, how many coins and yeah. yeah so. I I think it's just a, a sort of a misnomer to 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 say a two billion dollar market cap when. Is it really valued? I mean, it, I, I think it's a misnomer. Like it's a word that's not being used in its intended meaning. But sure. uh, I don't know what other u- word to use. Uh, right. Um, you know, and, and it's just it's just a, a, a I mean a, a something if, I wanted to pick at if, because if, the point is is like if you're communicating, you're, obviously what we're doing is we're trying to communicate ideas and talk about you know persuade people and things like that. Um, you know, like market cap, it's sort of. Well, it got me thinking, and and this connects to a video we saw the other day, and and got me thinking about how the language you use, uh, we use with Bitcoin, uh, needs and and perhaps ought to be different than the language we use when talking about investing in like oh, a stock market. I, I definitely think that. I think that. I mean, it's used so much on the internet. I I, I don't even try to harp on it anymore, but I. I do not think people should consider uh, Bitcoin or Dash an investment. It's right. not an investment. Right, but if you watch Bloomberg and you hear them talk about Bitcoin and, and, or, or any of these, they're going to talk, well, why are investors X, Y, or Z not with Bitcoin? Or like, why are investors not buying? Or why are investors something, something? Yeah, they're and, always, it's, if, you, if you own Bitcoin, you're an investor, apparently. Yeah, and, and I don't think that's the, the case. There's a very real reason this is, this is not an investment. An investment is when you, you buy something and then you want to create something like a product or a ser- good or service and sell it. Right, so you invest and you buy the capital equipment to to produce the good or service, and that's what an investment is. Or you invest the time to uh, to to get yourself uh, hone your skills and provide the service. Uh, that's what investment is. When you this is just buying and selling. Yeah. With Bitcoin, it's just buying and selling. Well, it's gambling. I mean, yeah, and, and uh, isn't it? I mean, you're, I you're buying with the hopes that it goes up. Well, so you can sell that's it. if you're buying the things to I speculate. Mean, but right. I. I I also kind of think of it as hedging, right? If, sure. you're, if okay. you're worried about your local currency going doing something crazy, you can hedge and and have something else that's not your local currency. Um, I, I I kind of I just think it, I I think I approach it more as hedging, and I think that uh, is very common because when you're trying to hedge, you're trying to reduce your amount of risk. And so so, so you I mean even though these cryptos go up and up and down up 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 and down are very volatile. You could, you could, if you're, if you're thinking in terms of hedging, you always try to reduce that risk, and generally you make good trades. Well, there, you there are risk. people investing, though. I mean, so Bitfinex just oh, that, recently that, that's announced investment. that they, yeah, well, there's margin trading. Yeah, so, so that's an investment because you've got all the the, the website and all that. I mean, to, I, I, once again, I would say that's gambling. 
Yeah, I would not say that's investing. Well, no, the people, the people, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like the people that let's, trade on it are not investing, but the people that build the website that provides that service. Okay, so, yeah, but see, that's not what we're talking about when we say investing with Bitfinex. You're not, you're not, you know, working on the front end of Bitfinex's website. Okay, you know what I'm saying? That's that's why the language sort of needs to change with the current the change in currency. You know, like the cryptocurrencies are different than a fiat and the government backed currencies of old. And and the way we describe, the way we talk about it, also needs to follow through and change. Because if we use the same language, then we're going to get muddied up in the same. Oh, well, you know what the U.S. dollar uses, right? What's that? M one, M two, M three. They have these measures, different measures for what they want to count as money. Okay. And so, like M two is often quoted. It's like everything but money market accounts or something like that. Um. So, uh, so uh, maybe we should talk about. B1 or B2 or like no. the Bitcoin supply or the D1 is the Dash supply or something like that. I don't know. I, I Well, you know, and, and that in DB, Dash goes right, back yeah. to what to, to complete this is sort of that idea. It's that, well, if we talk about the market cap, let's talk about the, the hashing power. Let's talk about the volume. Let's talk about a lot oh, of other yeah. metrics that can give oh. a person the idea of what's actually going well, on. I can with tell this you about currency. the hashing power of Dash right now. What is it? And that's a story, kind of. Uh, the, the, dash, the hashing power is three terahashes, and it hasn't really gone up much uh, as the price goes up, which is uh, contrary to what normally happens. But the reason why that's happening is because they actually sold out a dash miners, dash ASIC miners. There's no, there, no, nobody's making them to sell them right now. You can buy them on eBay, but you can't buy a, a, a pristine new one. Wow. They so had, someone came and wanted to make dash ASICs, and then it they, sort of sputtered because dash took they sold, forever. Yeah. They, to to get off of that six to eight twelve dollar mark. Yeah, and now it's up there, and everybody bought them, and now there there's no more. And now those ASIC companies are waiting for, uh, calling everyone back in. Yeah, <laughs> I wonder how much they're going for on eBay right now. Oh, uh, seven hundred to a thousand, twelve hundred. Wow. Well, well, I wonder what they were going for a few weeks ago. Uh, Three hundred. Okay. Well, there you Darren go. knows. So uh, the Ethereum updates to continue us. Uh, the new programming language update released, and then their name yeah, service solidity. And yeah, the name service was just something they were trying to do this like .eth that was basically sort of like .com or .net or anything like that, a top level domain. But this .eth would be something that was decentralized to be run through the Ethereum Mist not, uh, browser uh, or something like that. Name, ba- the, not the domain name server that normally people use. Yeah, right. And this would be this was something they were going to be releasing with an auction, basically where you are staking a certain number of ether to hold a decentralized domain name and you would uh bid on it and then there was some bid and reveal periods that were planned in but some, uh, i guess a bug was discovered a few hours before the auction went live and so they've postponed it well that's good they've discovered it and they prevented the auction because that's all we need is another dow right oh yeah exactly <laughs> Yeah, so well, I, uh, you know, I and I just hope that that you know that those ambitious ideas that that people have for making things like the DAO aren't quelched uh, or, or or chilled for too long because I think that Ethereum could do a lot of great things. Uh, we got another update on them too. Yeah, and then there was uh, something interesting I saw in the Ethereum subreddit this week. There's something called EtherChain Lite, which is a lightweight blockchain explorer for uh, private Ethereum chains. So uh, this is something that is up on GitHub for developers to check out. Uh, it cites that there it, it says that there are several excellent Ethereum blockchain explorers available that you can use on the mainnet or the testnet, but that there are no current network agnostic blockchain explorers available for Ethereum style blockchains. Uh, so if you wanted if you were a developer that wanted to de- develop DApps on a private testnet, or if you wanted to launch a private or consortium network, this uh, new uh, program that they're working on on GitHub is called EtherChain Lite, and it would allow you to explore such chains. So we'll have a link to that, of course, on neocashradio.com. Excellent. Wow. Well, uh, do you guys have, have anything else? We're going to wrap it up here. On the investment side, we had just mentioned marginal trading a while ago, and of course, uh, we, we don't uh, advise people to buy or sell anything here That's on right. Neocash Radio. Uh, but for people who do engage in margin trading, Bitfinex did just launch a couple different new pairs uh, with Monero, so you can margin trade between Monero and the U.S. dollar, Monero and Bitcoin, also with Dash and the U.S. dollar, Dash and Bitcoin, Zcash and the U.S. dollar, and Zcash and Bitcoin pairs. All right, so just a reminder that you can tune in to Neocash Radio every Wednesday night. You can find us on Google Play Music, iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, YouTube, Podcast Addict, LBRY, and more. In studio with you is JJ, Darren, and Randy for Neocash Radio, where we discuss the future of money today. Neo 
podcastradio.com.